welcome to Hollywood Radio Theater. Adaptations of Hollywood's finest film. Tonight, Barry Sullivan stars in Rope of Sand. Good evening. This is your host on Hollywood Radio Theater, Air Force Sergeant Tom Korzanowski. For tonight's feature presentation, we've chosen a story of intrigue and romance set in South Africa's diamond fields, Rope of Sand. Our star is Barry Sullivan. Act One begins after this important message. What starts fires on kitchen stoves? Forgetfulness. Mother is heating lunch for the children in a frying pan. The baby runs home crying with a nasty scratch. Mother rushes to the medicine chest to help baby, then stays to comfort the child. The frying pan, untended, overheats. It turns a bright cherry red. The food inside smokes, then flames. Unless mother smells the smoke of burning food, chances are the house will burn down. Think fire prevention. And now, Act One of Rope of the Sand, starring Barry Sullivan. Nothing had changed. They were the same sheet iron warehouses along the docks, the same slow moving stevedores waiting on the wharf, the same glaring sky, the same suffocating heat. The port of Diamond Start, British Southwest Africa, was as changeless, as ugly as the souls of the men who lived there. of the freighter, I could see the low hills behind the town. And along the crest of those hills, the silhouettes of the watchtowers where men waited with rifles and machine guns. On the other side of those hills, there would be still other men in armored cars and half tracks. Men in machines that patrol the endless miles of sand dunes which surround, like a rope of sand, the richest diamond-bearing area in the world. The freighter docked and the steam winches went to work bringing the cargo up from below deck. I was standing by the forward hold, waiting for my own gear to be hauled up. David. You. David. It was Vogel. Commandant Vogel of the Diamond Company Special Police. He came up the gangplank with a couple of deputies at his heels. David. I warned you not to come back to Diamond Stud. Uh-huh. And yet you don't seem surprised to see me. No, I've been expecting you. I've been waiting. You still have your blue jacket? The one with my bloodstains on it? Now, listen, David. Ah, ah, Commandant. Mustn't lose your temper in this heat. Bad for the heart, you know. Why are you here, David? What do you want? Well, at the moment, just my gear. This is it coming up from the hole. The net with my equipment swung overhead, and then suddenly it plummeted toward the deck. Oh, a pity, Mr. David. I'm afraid your gear is completely ruined. A regrettable accident. I'm not so sure it was an accident. That's one of your deputies standing over there by the winch, isn't it? And you think perhaps he reversed the engine? Possibly he did, Mr. Davis. Quite possibly. Oh, go. Uh-uh. Mustn't lose your temper in this heat. Bad for the hop, you know. Vogel, I came back here telling myself I'd forgotten what this place did to me. That all I wanted was my license back. But seeing you again has changed my mind. I'm back for one thing. To get something I've already paid for. And you'll pay again, David. Don't forget my blue jacket. I've still got it. And all I want is an excuse to use it. I wasn't likely to forget Vogel's blue jacket. The jacket with the brass buttons and the yachting club insignia on it. The ceremonial coat Vogel always wore whenever he conducted one of his famous interrogations. Where are they, David? Where are the diamonds? 
He's a stubborn man, Mr. Martin Gale. But I'll crack him. I'll crack him. But he didn't. Rogel had a disappointment, Mr. Martingale. The elegant Mr. Arthur Martingale, General Superintendent for the Colonial Diamond Company, Limited. I wondered just how many minutes it would take Vogel to tell Martingale I was back in Diamond Stuff and what Martingale's first move would be. And for my first move, I checked into the Sandy Hill Hotel and then headed to the bar. There was just one other customer, Doc Hunter. And me? Another one, Doc. Make it another four, Henry. That'll take care of the next hour. Since when did you start to ration yourself, Doc? Just since you were away, Mike. About two years ago. Yeah? You feel better for it? The only thing that will make me feel better is the day I leave Diamond Star. Well, why don't you? Oh, I'm still the company doctor. Yeah, why don't you quit? <laughs> why did you come back? Business? I'm making a survey. Oh, scotch and soda, Star. Thank you, Henry. My pleasure, Doc. Uh, Jose, you say? Yeah. To find which of Vogel's boys drinks the most, owes the most, and hates Vogel the most. Interesting. Henry. Yeah, Doc? What happened to our friend Thompson? Thompson? Oh, he'll probably eat him later. He really shouldn't, Henry. He's drinking far too much. By noon, every day. He's already three parts elephant. Yeah, I guess I'd be too if I had Thompson's job. I don't know how anybody can drive one of those half-tracks across the desert for eight hours every night. The prohibited area must be patrolled, and the greed must be guarded against at all costs. Mm, maybe, but not by me, Doc. Now, Mike, uh, what were you saying about this survey of yours? Uh, I just finished it. Henry. Yes, sir? One scotch and water. I'll be waiting for it at the table right over there. Make it two scotches, Henry. Mr. Davis has just invited me to a drink. It was Toby. Nobody in Dynastad could remember what his real name was. He was just Toby, always around, always available for a price. He followed me to my table and let me pay for his drink. He's been absent for such a long time. Yes, a very long time. I heard a curious story the other day, Mr. Davis. It is about a young man, a hunter, who used to make his living around here as a guide until, until he got into trouble. What kind of trouble? Oh, it, it seems he took an impetuous gentleman on a lion hunt. At first, there was no success. And then, one day, they sighted their lion. Uh -huh. They trailed him for three days. And each day, they came nearer and nearer and nearer to the prohibited diamond area. <laughs> Do you find this interesting, Mr. Davis? I find it interesting. <laughs> then... One night, the hunting party came very close to the prohibited area. And to amuse the gentlemen, the hunter told some of the tales of the diamonds which could be found only a few inches beneath the sand. Diamonds which could be scooped up by the pound by the bushel. Mr. Davis, you are sure I'm not boring you? I'll let you know. <laughs> well, it seems that the following morning, when the guide woke up, his gentleman was gone. And footprints led into the prohibited area. When the hunter finally found the gentleman, he was delirious. And wallowing, actually wallowing in a bed of diamonds. According to the story. According to the story. Yeah. The rest of it is rather tragic. The young hunter carried the delirious gentleman out of the prohibited area, only to be arrested by the diamond police. They were taken to Commandant Vogel, and while he was questioning them, the delirious gentleman died. Died. Babbling about the whole gully full of diamonds. And the garden? Oh, he was badly beaten by the police, but he never told them where the diamonds could be found. He simply disappeared from Diamond Star. It is rumored he might have been imprisoned. But the curious part of the story is that this young man, this guide, is supposed to be back here right now. Hmm. The reason for his return is obvious, of course. Of course. Mr. Davis, if you should ever meet this young man, this guy, you might deliver a message for me. Saying what? Mm, saying that, uh, that I am here, a fountain of extraordinary knowledge, splendidly corrupt, and eager to be of profitable service. Well, I don't think he'll need you. One never knows. One never... Well, excuse me, Mr. Davis. Urgent business calls me away. Oh. Business with the appearance of a couple of special police in the doorway. 
I ordered another scotch and waited for the arrival of the man who drank too much, owed too much, and who hated Vogel just enough. Six o'clock, seven, then eight, but no Thompson. And so there was Vogel himself with Martingale and a girl. She was tall and blonde and wore a dress far better suited to the Rue de la Paix than a smoky bar room in Diamondstadt. Martingale brought her over to my table. Miss Reynaud, may I present Mr. Michael Davis? Michael, Miss Suzanne Reynaud. Mr. Davis? Hello. Miss Reynaud is the niece of one of our largest French stockholders, Michael. I flew her up from Cape Town this afternoon. Why? Why, Mr. Davis? Nobody comes to Diamondstadt unless he or she has to. I happen to enjoy big game hunting, Mr. Davis. I was sure the lions are very good to the north of here. Uh, would you care to show them to her, Michael? After all, you were our best hunter. And yes. I did. You know as well as I do, I can't even guide Miss Renault across the street without my license. Well, then I'll see that you get it back. When? As soon as you tell us where the diamonds are. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has met you, Miss Renault. Uh, uh, Michael. The only diamonds I know anything about are Ace, King, Queen, and Jack. I'll see you sometime, Martin Gale. Uh, <laughs> We've been talking. Doc Hunter had signaled to me from the bar. I wandered up alongside and ordered another drink. Doc whispered at the man I wanted to see, Thompson, who drank poker with some others outside on the hotel veranda. Ten minutes later, I was not only seated across the table from him, but Thompson owed me five pounds. I, uh, I'll have to give you my IOU, David. Well, that's all. Maybe you'll win it all back in the next ten. Yeah, I can't. I got to go on patrol in 15 minutes. Oh, then maybe tomorrow night, huh? Yeah, I'll be here. Mr. Davies? Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. Oh, 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 come on. Yes, Mr. Hunt? You can have a cigarette. I'm afraid I left mine inside. <laughs> you really want one, or is this just an excuse? <laughs> it wasn't very original of me, was it? Frankly, Mr. Davies, it bores me to spend an evening listening to Mr. Martingale and Mr. Vogel talk business. Mm -hmm. well, maybe they think that's the way to make an impression on the niece of the biggest French stockholder. I wish you could forget about that. Why? Because I'd like for us to be friends. Why? Because I think you need a friend. I hate to repeat myself, Miss Renault, but again, why? I was going to say because I feel that you are lonely and intense and unhappy. But now I think a man as suspicious as you does not have friends because he cannot have them. Have a cigarette? Please. Thank you. Yeah. They hate each other, don't they? Who? Mm. Martin Gale and Vogel. Yeah, bitterly. Martin Gale is on the board of directors of the Diamond Company, belongs to the best clubs in Cape Town, and is a gentleman most of the time. Paul Vogel was the son of an illiterate German farmer who wants to be on the board of directors of the Diamond Company, wants to belong to the best clubs in Cape Town, and wants to be a gentleman part of the time. Which Martin Gale will never permit. Hey, you catch him fast. Yes, Commandant Vogel has climbed just about as high up the ladder as he'll ever get. Thank you, Mr. Davis. What about you? Me? I'm... Lonely and intense and unhappy and suspicious. Remember? <laughs> My apologies, Mademoiselle Reno. But I wish a word with Mr. Davis. Certainly. I'll be in the bar, Mr. Davis. Hello, Vogel. I hear you've been playing cards with one of my men. You know, I'd heard that you even policed your own police. It's not to happen again, Davis. Is that clear? Vogel, I need money. Lots of it. I'll play poker with anyone who's got cash to lose. I'd even play with you. <laughs> For a miserable 10 shilling stake, I suppose. It wouldn't be worth my while. Uh, gentlemen, permit me to Martin remedy Davis? that, yes. Mr. Davis, I shall be happy to back you. What stakes do you suggest? Make it 500 pounds. Only 500? Oh, shall we say, uh, 1,000? Well, how about it, Vogel? All right. 1,000 pounds. We went back into the bar, and Martin Gale called for a pack of cards. The news got around fast. By the second floor, everybody in the bar was crowded around our table, including Mr. Nome. Fifty. And raise your fifty. All right. You win. Right. Your information, Vogel, I have a ten high. Uh, uh, and Vogel had an ace. Good bluff, Michael. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Mind the jack. You're a bit, Mr. Davis. Everything I've got. I call that. I have a full house. Mind the full house. Queen's up. I have a full house. Ace is up. 
Vogel well, raked in the pile of chips and collected Martingale's money. Then he got up, offered his arm to Miss Renault. She nodded and smiled, and they left the room together. You seem uh, puzzled, Michael. Perhaps Miss Renault? Yeah, I... I thought she came in with you. Uh, she did, but unfortunately women, especially beautiful women, have no allegiance to losers. <laughs> Besides, I'm sure Paul Vogel will be a most gallant host. He's taking her to his house? Oh, naturally. <laughs> it's quite a place, Michael. A pity you've never seen it. The furnishings and artworks are in excellent taste. Uh, there's one vase he has in particular. A magnificent Sevres porcelain, signed 1782, I believe. That's worthy of any money. Well, when talked, I absentmindedly oh, shuffled the playing hard. cards that Vogel and I had used. Right, and suddenly I noticed yeah. something odd about the cards. I shoved the package in my pocket. Oh, oh, Girl, is your car outside? Why, uh, yes, yes, it is. May I borrow it for a few minutes? But of course, Michael. <laughs> Vogel's house was about ten minutes' drive out of town. I didn't bother to ring the bell, and since the front door was unlocked, I simply walked in. Telegraph news, it came from some room at the end of the long hall. As you can see, it's signed right here. Favor, 1782. Good. The most perfect vase I've ever seen. All my life. My backs were to me. I waited until Vogel set the vase down on the side table, then I slipped up behind him and grabbed the vase. But until this moment, there's been one lack. The perfect woman. Forgive me, Vogel, for interrupting such a tender scene. Stay right where you are, Vogel, or I might drop this exquisite vase of yours. Mademoiselle Renault, would you mind waiting in the other room? Now, let her stay. Maybe she'd be interested in knowing how you won a poker tonight. If you're suggesting that I... I'm more than suggesting. I'm saying that you mark those aces with your fingernail. So if you please, Vogel, 2,000 pounds. 2,000? Yeah, Martin Gale's 1,000 and 1,000 for me for not dropping this vase. Well, I... I don't have the money on me. Well, that's too bad. When did you say this vase was made? Do you remember, Miss Renault? I think 1782. Oh, must be kind of valuable. Yes, very valuable. You know, my hands are getting very slippery. The heat, you know. Davis, please. 2000. Yes. Yes, here. Yeah. <laughs> you take it from her, Miss Renault. All right. Good. And now, mademoiselle, I think you'd better let me drive you back to town. Come on. Davis! My vase! Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here, catch. Mr. Davis? Yeah. Thank you for the rescue. Boy, how about that, Miss Renault? Now, maybe this is the way you amuse yourself in Paris. But in Paris, you got stop-and-go signals on the street corners and traffic cops to see that everybody follows the rules. But this is not Paris, and Vogel's no traffic cop, and there are no stop-and-go signals here. Because they haven't even put on the road yet. That's what I'm finding out. So thank you for the rescue. And I hope I'll be able to do the same for you. Yeah. What makes you think I'll need rescuing just because I smashed Vogel's precious vase? No. Just because you've come back to Diamond Stats. Just because you know about that girl he filled with diamonds somewhere inside the Freundiger area. Oh, so you heard about it, too. Everybody has, Mr. Davis. And everybody is waiting for you to do the foolish thing. The thing you must not do. Yeah, that sounds odd, coming from the niece of the largest French stockholder. If I show the company where the diamonds are, that means bigger and better dividends for Uncle. Don't do it, Mr. Davis. Well, can you name me a reason? Because I like you. I like you very much. Yeah, that's flattering. Not exactly a reason. I think it is. I like you too much to want to see you dead. Act one of Rope of Sand, tonight's feature presentation on Hollywood Radio Theater. Act two begins in just one moment. A captain assigned a new station with his troops had a deep conversation. While you're overseas, men, be intelligent, and then you continue with your education. What have you done about your education? And now, Act Two of Roof of Sand, starring Barry Sullivan as Mike. Next morning, I returned Martin Gale's thousand pounds to him. Out of gratitude, I suppose, he invited me to a party that night at his house. A party in honor of Suzanne Renault. I told Martin Gale I'd be there if I finished my other business on time. The business, of course, was Thompson. 
He had promised to meet me that evening in the bar of the Sandy Hill Hotel. Another one, Mr. Davis? Henry, I haven't finished this one yet. I shall be happy to relieve you of that charm, Mr. Davis. Go away, Tony. But to where, well, Mr. Davis? Outside, the heat of the night oppresses me. There is a wind which blows and seals like the very sign of hell's furnace. And only increases my thirst. Uh, why are we here, Mr. Davis? Why must we be so infatuated with this woman? What woman? This courtesan, this enchantress, this desert. We pluck at her skirts uh. and we hope for some small glittering favor. This wasteland where the gems lie just a few inches below the surface. Free. Free for the taking if it were not for certain unfortunate restrictions. This diamond... For instance, Henry. Yes, sir. Give this guy a drink. Maybe then he'll go peddle his rug somewhere else. <laughs> the diamond, for instance. Chemically speaking, yes. A bit of carbon. A collection of soup. Yet, the hardest of all matters. So hard, in fact, that whatever it touches must suffer. Glass, steel, the human soul. And yet, we will do anything for this uh, bit of soup, won't we, Mr. Davis? For example, if you were to ask my help... I'm not asking. A pity. A pity. Mm. But let us assume for the sake of argument... Mr. Davis! Mr. Davis, please! I got away from Cody just as Thompson came into the bar. I motioned him to follow me out into the hallway. I saw where they're going to play poker. Uh, some other time. Thompson, how would you like to have enough money to pay off all your gambling debts and your bar bill and still have enough left over for a big time in Cape Town? Yeah, what do I do for all this? You let me knock you out? Is that all? Well, not quite. You take your half track out on patrol at midnight. At 12.05, just outside town, I hold you up, knock you out, and take your half track. Yeah. Which just happens to have enough gasoline to take you out of the prohibited area and on through the Portuguese territory. Yeah, that's the idea. A one-way trip to Angola. Well, how about it? <laughs> you know, up till now, I never believed all those stories about you. I guess you really do know where those diamonds are. I asked how about it. Let's see your money. He settled for 250 pounds. Meanwhile, at Martingale's house, the party for Miss Renault was in full swing. May I get you some more champagne, Miss Renault? Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Mademoiselle Renault. Yes, Commander? I must be alone. At once. Well, I'm sorry, but Dr. If, Hunter... If you will step out onto the veranda... It is most important. Very well. And now, Commander? I must explain to you about last night, about that uh, card game with Dave. I'm sure it's none of my affairs. But I want you to respect the son. Why do you think I showed you my house last night? Why do you think I asked you to come out here right now? Come out, Joe. From the moment Martin Gale first introduced us, I've known that you were the one woman I wanted for my wife. The one woman worthy of my home. Come on, Doc. The answer is no. No? I'm sorry. But, but this is ridiculous. Cesar, listen to me. No, let me go. I've got to have no, no stop it. By that, mademoiselle, I take it there's someone else. Yes, my baby. <laughs> then how sad for you, mademoiselle. Come on, Doc. Madame Vogel. Yes, who is it? Over here. I've got to see you. Excuse me, mademoiselle. Gladly. Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, Mr. Our dear Commandant Vogel, the great gentleman, the discerning art connoisseur, proposes to a cheap dance hall girl and is rejected by Mr. Her. Martin Gale. Oh, is all that so soon forgotten, my dear? Only three days ago, a penniless dance in Cape Town, and now a great lady with fine clothes and furs and jewels. Well, my dear, forget what you wish, but not the bargain we make, you and I. No, I'm not going ahead with you. Too much. I think Mike Davis is already in love with you. That was to be step number one, remember? Step number two, you will whisper one question into his ear. Darling, where are the diamonds? And if I refuse? Then I can only conclude that you yourself have fallen in love. 
which case I shall be obliged to let Vogel have his way with Michael. He intends to anyway. I think something is going on right now. Right now? Look out there on the veranda. Hmm? See that man talking with Vogel? Oh, yes, I see him. Henry, the bartender at the hotel. One of Vogel's paid informants. Hmm. Must be very important. In that case, perhaps I should... Miss Reno. Miss Reno. Well, well. At least she could have done me the courtesy to excuse herself if one can expect manners of a downfall girl. <laughs> Don't you suppose I see your bags all packed, that pistol on your bed? It's tonight, isn't it? Yeah, I'm leaving right now. No, Vogel knows he's waiting for you. Oh, did he tell you? Of course not. But the man came to see Vogel at the party. And the way Vogel talked about you, I wish you were already dead. Eric, you're being hysterical. Yes, please believe me. I have a feeling about tonight, a premonition. I'm sorry, Suzanne. Don't go feminine on me. I haven't got time for hunches. I've got a timetable to keep. No, Mac, no. So long. Wish me luck. No, Mac. According to the plan, Thompson was to take the usual road out of town. At five minutes past midnight, he would reach a certain spot in Waltstein Canyon. I'd be waiting for him. I got there a couple of minutes ahead of time. A couple of minutes in which to think about Suzanne's warning. Then I saw the headlights of the half track boring through the night. The headlights blinked three times. That, too, was according to plan. Thompson? Yeah. Hurry it up. Everything okay? Yeah, sure it is. Get it. Not tonight. We'll try it another time. No, it's got to be tonight. I don't dare risk it again. What's that? <laughs> it's Vogel. Why, you dirty liar. I didn't want to tell him. Vogel found out somehow. He hauled me in. His men beat me till I couldn't take it anymore. I just couldn't take it anymore. This Martingale. I give the orders here. And this is Diamondstadt, my dear Paul. I give the orders for this entire district. But for how much longer, I wonder? If I tell the directors of the... No, 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 you won't. Now take off that blue jacket. I prefer you dressed for more informal occasions. At once, Paul. Anything else? Yes. Tell your guards to carry Michael over to his hotel. And then to send Dr. Hunter up to him. Vogel and Martingale argued some more, but if they did, I didn't hear it because I was unconscious. When I came to, I was back in my hotel room, and Doc Hunter was putting compresses on my back. And I fell asleep. When I woke up, soft, cool hands were caressing my face. Oh, Mike. Oh, Mike, what have they done to you? Suzanne. Suzanne, why did they let me go? Don't try to say it, darling. Just rest. But I've got to know why. Oh, Mike, I love you. Martingale made Vogel stop, but he must have had a reason. Darling, it was me. You? I went to Martingale. I told him if he didn't stop Vogel, I'd go to Cape Town and tell them what's going on here about the horrible brutality. And if Cape Town wouldn't listen, I'd go to Paris and tell my uncle. Uh, for once, I don't mind you being the niece of the largest French stockholder. Oh, Mike, I'm not be able to save you again. You've got to forget about those diamonds. Never. Darling, listen. No, to no, me. don't you see, Suzanne? The first time Vogel beat me, it was for doing absolutely nothing. I was simply a hunter and a guy that followed his employer into the prohibited area to bring him out. He was delirious with heat and thirst, and I was trying to save him. I didn't pick up a single diamond. I didn't, didn't even want them then. But Vogel beat me just the same, and the government took away my license. Now I'm going to get what I've already paid for. I'd crawl out of the grave to get what I came after. Right, I call right, but just leave it and oh, don't be a fool. If they ever cost Can you, I... Have I... To you? you just leave you my life stops anyway. Oh, Mike, let me get the diamonds for no, you. you can't. I'd never let you through the barrier. I'll get a special pass for nothing, Dave. You wouldn't dream of the Oh, no, you're a woman. You couldn't last out on a desert. You wouldn't know where to start looking. You wouldn't... Give me a map. And perhaps you have a friend who could go along with me. He wouldn't do for me. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. There is no other way, Mike. Vogel will have his men watching you every minute, day and night. Now, let me think about it. We'll talk about it again tonight. I didn't 
like any part of the idea. On the other hand, well, there wasn't much choice. After Suzanne left, I phoned out of the bar and had them tell Tildy to come up to my room. I am delighted to see you again, Mr. Davis. And I hope your unpleasant experience will not keep you a bit too long, sir. No, it shouldn't. Love will let me off easy this time. The beginning of wisdom. Perhaps he has at last decided you are a man immune to violence, but receptive to the more gentle approach. Yes. It at least provides happy memories, huh? What are you talking about? The woman. The lady known here in Diamondstadt as Mademoiselle Suzanne Renault. Known as Mademoiselle Renault? And known in Cape Town under various other names and various waterfront cafes and dance halls. You're lying. Mr. Davis, I assume that you knew that you were simply enjoying some slight flirtation with this person, but without any... Listen, reason. you filthy-minded scum. Martin Gale gave a party in honor of Miss Renault just last night. She's the niece of one of his largest French stockholders. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, of course. Mr. Martin Gale has dressed her and coached her very well for the part. But tell me, Mr. Davis, has she not once asked you about the diamonds? Where they are to be found? Perhaps even a map? Get out of here. But you just invited me up Get here. Out. Get out! Very well. As you wish, Mr. Davis. As you wish. I wasn't going to take the word of anybody like Tody, but just to play safe, I drew a map of where the diamonds were to be found. A false map. And when Suzanne came to see me again that evening, I gave it to her. I said I was making arrangements for somebody to go with her into the prohibited area. I'd let her know in the morning. And then Dr. Hunter came in to change my bandages, and Suzanne left. I asked Doc to stand at the window and watch the street below. Just what am I supposed to be looking for? Oh, anything you see of interest? Well, the street's almost deserted. Can you see the entrance to Vogel's police quarters? Sure, it's just across the street. Say, there's somebody going inside right now. Anybody I know? I think so. Mademoiselle Renault. <laughs> Act two of Rope from Sand. Our third and final act begins after this brief message. A friend of mine had a magnificent stereo system. He had tuners that tune and tweeters that tweeted and woofers that woof. And day by day, he added one more gadget that deepened the bass or heightened the highs until one day he achieved the ultimate in a home stereo system. Perfect fidelity. Don't overdo it. At least not on one electrical outlet. And now let's return for the final act of tonight's Hollywood Radio Theater featuring Rope of Sand with our star, Barry Sullivan. <laughs> Learning the truth about Suzanne hurt almost as much as the bite of Vogel's whip across my back. But this time, I wasn't going to stay in bed and nurse my wounds. As soon as Dr. Hunter changed my bandages, I got up and dressed. You know, Mike, as your doctor, I don't recommend this. Just how bad else am I, Doc? In case anyone asks me? In case Vogel or Martin Gale get curious. Oh, very bad, Mike. Concussion of the brain you won't be up out of your bed for three days, at least. That's well. Then maybe you better not wait for them to ask you. Go tell Vogel right now. Consider him told. And, Mike, good luck. I knew that the minute Suzanne gave the map, the wheels would begin to turn. Vogel wouldn't wait until morning to start out to the Valley of Diamonds. Already he must be loading a half track with gas and provisions. I waited for them in Wolstein Canyon at almost the same spot where I met Thompson the night before. The wind was blowing even harder this time. The dust and sand cut visibility to not more than ten yards. Just the way I wanted it. At the first ground of the hair track, I threw myself flat on the ground directly in the path that the machine had to take. Rudy, stop! There's some dreadful foot pass down. Get him off the roadway. Yes, sir. There were only two men on the hair track. There were and a man coming toward me. I waited until he got right up to me and bent over. Come on, Chip. On your feet. Hey, 
back room, Dover, if I died between the great iron treads and the machine passed harmlessly over my body. But what it did to the other man wasn't pretty. Volga leaped out and ran back to check up. I stayed flat in the dirt and slipped the pistol out of my pocket. Drop your gun, Volga, or the next time I won't aim for your shoulder. You're a fool, David. You're a fool. You're a bigger one to fall for the same trick twice. Come on, help me get your driver into the head track. What for? He's dead, isn't he? Yes, you scum. You killed one of your own men just to get me. Come on, pick him up. No. I ain't no pretty kill. I said pick him up. I got the body into the rear of the half track and I covered it over with a tarpaulin. And I shoved my pistol into Vogel's ribs and told him to drive us to the gate through the barrier. Good evening, Commandant. That's what a telephone to expect you. We've already notified all other patrols. Thank you. You may raise the gate. Uh, yes, sir, but when do you return? I don't know. Raise the gate. Yes, sir. Nobody could get in my way or bring me back. Where are we? At least 20 miles from nowhere. Now pick up that radio telephone. Call your headquarters. You have thought of everything, haven't you? Everything. Now, quick, think up a little speech that will keep the boys back home fat, dumb, and happy for the rest of the night. And remember, if you make one little mistake... I understand all that. Okay. Then flip the switch. This is Fogel speaking. This is Fogel. I'm on an important reconnaissance. Clear all patrols from the northwest area. Do not try to contact me again. I will be operating under radio silence. Over and out. Okay. Now get out. No. No! It's more than you deserve, Vogel. You killed one of your own men and you'd kill me if you could. All you're getting is a long walk home. See, we're in the middle of the desert. I don't know which way I... Isn't that just too bad? Now out. Out. Side of the black hills that were my marker. In another hour, I reached the valley and the gully of Dan. They were scattered everywhere, just beneath the top gravel, exactly as I had remembered. I filled my hat with them. In a few more hours, I'd be in Portuguese territory, safe and a rich man. And in a few more hours, where would Commandant Vogel be? Commandant Vogel, you ordered all patrols out of the area? I don't care what I ordered. After that length of time, you should have investigated. We did, sir. That's how the patrol found you. Uh, stop arguing. Bring Dr. Hunt and the girl in here. Yes, sir. Doctor, Miss Reynolds. Thompson, you stand guard outside. Yes, sir. I suppose you're pleased with yourself, Doctor. And you too, Miss Reynolds. But if either of you have any hope of joining Mr. Davis in Angola to share his wealth, I must disappoint you. It is enough for me to know that Mike is safe in Angola. Dr. Hunter, I charge you with criminally underestimating your patient's powers of recuperation to mislead me and allow Davis to escape. As for you, Miss Renault, you will be charged with giving aid to a criminal. You sent me to a trap with a counterfeit map. Counterfeit. Oh, come now. There's no need to pretend surprise. When you brought me that map, you said you did so in order to save Mr. Davis from his own folly. You pretended to bargain with me for his life. And all the time you were lying. A cheap, lying girl of the dance hall. Come on, don't. Yes. Martin Gale finally told me what you were. Something from the capital. Oh, I suggest that you apologize. Ah, I will not. You have insulted this girl as you insult everyone. Ah. Dr. Hunter! Dr. Hunter! Come on, come on, get him on his feet. I can't. He hit his head against the desk. He's dead. Ah. And you killed him? No. Yes, with his paperweight from my desk. Samson! Samson! Yes, Commandant. 
Lizanne Renault is under arrest for the murder of Dr. Hunter. Take her away. No, no, no! Our drink. Our drink. But, sir, this is Angola. It is not 2.40 in the morning. Our water is drink. Our Portuguese law say this hour we must be closed. No more drink. Give me a drink. Yeah, drink. Please, Senor, please. It is very fortunate, Mr. Davis, that you cannot smash a diamond that easily. Oh, wait, sir. Oh, how quickly our little triumphs tarnish. How quickly conquest turns heavy and unlovely in our arms. Do you remember, Mr. Davis, my little story about the hunter and the guy? Well... There is another chapter to it now. Go away. It seems he made it, yes, into the prohibited area and out again. A glorious dash. And now he has the diamond. Of course, there is still a problem. Somewhere he must find an unscrupulous person to polish the diamonds and then to dispose of them. <laughs> In such matters, I have had very great experience. Diamonds. <laughs> I think I have said it before. There is nothing but suffering from contact with this hardest of all matter. Glass, steel, the human soul, all must suffer. Dr. Hunter, for instance. He's dead, of course, now, but... Huh? huh? Is that Hunter? Oh, yes, so very dead. And I feel really sorry for Mademoiselle Renault. I cannot believe that she killed him. <laughs> and yet there is no one to prove differently. You know, what you're talking about, you're drunk. I am Mr. Davis. <laughs> no. I have even a newspaper clipping. Yeah, perhaps it is in my pocket. Oh, yeah. Here it is. If you care to read it. No, I don't have to. I know what it says. It says that says a French tramp tried to cross up Mike Davis and got herself crossed and... I want a drink. I want a drink! Anyone, anyone! Oh, very well, Mr. Davis. So long as you are determined to sacrifice this great fortune and go back to Daimerstadt to help the girl, I think I know a man who can arrange for us to make this trip quietly. Of course, I will need some money. <laughs> later, Tody and I slipped back into Diamond Stud. I headed straight for Martingale's house. From the driveway, I could see lights in the library and the silhouette of Martingale working at his desk. Behind the desk was a screen door, unlocked. Ah, I, I thought I heard footsteps outside, Michael. I have extraordinary ears, you know. I hope you've also got extraordinary eyes. That can tell you this gun is loaded. Michael, I must tell you immediately that I can never accept your proposition. Well, you haven't heard it yet. First, I want you to phone Vogel. Get him over here. It happens that he's on his way here now to discuss some business. Perfect. Now, about my proposition... I know. You have your diamonds. Now you want your girl. Uh, it's even better than that. An even trade. I give you the diamonds for the girl. You're serious? Completely. I never know what to think anymore. I'm being constantly disillusioned. Has money completely lost its power? Is everyone motivated now by love? Let's stick to the point. Is it a deal? Mm, it appeals to me. It would make a hero of me in the eyes of the company, and it would distress Vogel. But no. Is that your front door? Yes, it's Vogel. All right. Here. This is a note I want you to copy onto your typewriter. Well, may I uh, read it first? Sure. I'll be standing behind the door when Vogel walks in. Start typing. Come in, Paul. Well, what are you smiling about? <laughs> this thing I'm uh, I'm typing, Paul. <laughs> it's uh, quite an amusing document. What is it? I'll read it to you, Vogel. <clears throat> what? No gun, Commodore? How careless you've gotten since I left town. Martin Gale, what kind of a trick is this? None of my doing, I assure you. Ah, you're a. Uh, document, Michael. Thanks. And here's what it says, Vogel. To whom it may concern, Mademoiselle Suzanne Renault, known by whatever aliases, etc., etc., is innocent of the murder of Dr. Francis Kittredge Hunter. She will be released immediately. And there's a place for you to sign and for Martin Gale to witness. Davis, I'm getting very sick of your bluff. Come on, sign it. 
Martin Keeley. Don't appeal to me, Paul. I have an enormous antipathy to dying. Very well. Your pain. Now, you witness his signature, Martin Gale. Of course. This is a completely empty gesture, Davis. I'll have you under arrest before you and your girl get can get out of town. We do. That paper you just signed says Suzanne Renaud did not kill Dr. Hunter. But then who did, Vogel? Who else but you was in that room when he was killed? Commandant, you've just signed a confession of murder. No. I can prove before any court that I signed that with a gun at my back. Well, that's quite possible, Paul. Oh, by the way, won't you have a cigar? Well, gentlemen, that's all for tonight. I'll send you the diamonds, Martin Gale, just as soon as I'm sure Suzanne is all right. Well, that's fair enough. Goodbye, Michael. Sure. Uh, Paul, do try one of the cigars in this box. Oh, of course. Michael! <laughs> you gave him that gun, didn't you, Martin Gale? It was in that box of cigars. Yes, Michael, but I was rather confident that his first shot would go wild. As for you, it was self-defense, of course. Yeah, but suppose he killed me. Well, I took that gamble. Oh, you know, in his way, Paul was quite a remarkable fellow. Nasty, but remarkable. <laughs> Going away together, and yet you've never once said the words, the thing that I've been waiting to hear. I don't like speeches. Oh, but Mike. Mr. Davis! Mr. Davis! Uh, go away, Terry. Oh, come, Michael. Can't old friends wish you a bon voyage? Besides, I've got a going away present for you. Uh, here. How beautiful. Uh, these were two of the diamonds that you returned to me. Oh. Thanks, Martin. Yeah. Terry? Yes, Mr. Davis? A diamond for you. Uh, yes, so large, so exquisite. And the other, for you, Suzanne, your engagement ring. Mike, then, then you do love me? If you ever try to get away from me, I'd follow you until I wore the earth smooth. Is that what you wanted to hear? Oh, yes, darling, that's what I wanted to hear. Oh, well, well, time to go ashore, Tony. Come along. Uh, yes. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Davis. Mademoiselle Renault? A pleasant voyage. Thanks, it will be. Au revoir, au revoir. An amazing thing, Mr. Martin Gale, a diamond. Carbon, a bit of soot, chemically speaking, and yet the hardest of all matters. So hard that whatever it touches must suffer. Love. Just heard the final act of tonight's Hollywood Radio Theater presentation, Rope of Sand, starring Barry Sullivan. In a moment, news of next week's program. But first, this important message. An eager young airman named Dan, who was stationed somewhere in Japan, said, though here overseas, I can learn what I please. So I take all the courses I can. What have you done about your education? Next Sunday evening, Hollywood Radio Theater will bring you Sangaree. Our stars will be Arlene Dahl and Cesar Romero. Until next Sunday, then, this is your host, Air Force Sergeant Tom Korzanowski, wishing you a very pleasant good evening. <laughs>